The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. The Russians have landed. Just don't panic. The Russians are coming. They'll be shooting people in the streets. Are you now, or have you ever been, a member of the Communist Party? This is the question thousands of Americans were forced to answer during the years of anti-communist paranoia. From chewing gum vignettes for children to movies made in Hollywood, anti-communist propaganda would become one of the driving forces of American politics and the obsession of several skillful politicians. The witch hunt would fascinate America and Hollywood for more than 50 years. Propaganda is truth made into fantasy. During the war, after the Hitler-Stalin pact fell apart and they became our allies out of necessity, they were not just sanitized, they were romanticized, which actually was consistent with the way many Americans, liberal, progressive Americans, felt about Russia. Out of the turmoil of a world at war comes a romantic adventure of such infinite beauty and tenderness that it will win a lasting place among the screen's great love stories. You've done a dreadful thing to me, my dear, dear Nita. Taught me to love life again. Oh, darling. Days of Glory introduces two great new stars, Tumanova of the Ballet Russe and Broadway's distinguished stage star Gregory Peck in an exciting story of a man who learned the idealism of love, of a woman who learned the realism of war. Pro-Soviet uh, film production was something that is really the most forgotten part now of what happened in this whole story. Pro-Soviet movies, B-pictures, a B-picture meaning low-budget picture, were produced by Hollywood at that point, it was in our interest to begin making propaganda vehicles to get the support of the American people. Why? Because we were raising money to send over to Russia. We were uh, sending them weapons, billions of dollars of aid, and that had to have uh, support of the American people at some level or else you know, the Congress that was doing it would be in trouble. So now you have your propaganda entertainments to show how heroic the Russian people were in fighting our common enemy, the, the Nazis. Mission to Moscow is my report to the American people as ambassador of the United States to the Soviet Union. I wrote it as I saw it and lived it. Warner Brothers have courageously filmed it, true to the history as I saw it in the making. Mission to Moscow, the behind-the-scenes story of every world-shaking crisis of our day, the cataclysmic events which changed the entire course of human history. Behind the walls of the Kremlin, you'll learn the secret of the Russian power that smashed the Nazi tide. You'll learn for the first time the whole shocking truth about the plot that set off the powder keg of the world. So you were working out a deal, naturally, with representatives of Germany, of Germany and Japan. What happened is the further you went through the course of the war, the more major studios and major movie stars got involved. So just a couple years later, MGM, which was the number one studio, Warner Brothers, another big studio, they began making movies like Mission to Moscow and the, uh, Song of Russia and, you know, Robert Taylor, a huge action star, handsome leading man, visiting Moscow as a musician and he falls in love with this uh, Russian girl and all this. If we were in America, I were asked to describe you, I'd say, what a girl. It would be very nice to hear, even in Moscow. I mean, you can call it propaganda, but it also was true. You know, they were fighting heroically, and of course they were fighting to save their own country, but so what? Uh, and 
and that enabled us ultimately to win the war. So in Hollywood, there was no reason for the studios and the movie stars not to make these pictures like Mission to Moscow and Song of Russia and, uh, and all of those. You are the first American I've ever met with a soul. It has a strange effect on me. Listen, Theodore, you know, I wasn't figuring on marriage. Lucky for you, I'm the practical one. We must get married. It is the only way we can get permission to leave Russia. But to leave Russia? For where? To America. When we won the war and the powers sat down to divide up the after-war scenario, you had Churchill and Stalin and FDR, and Stalin kept saying, you know, I must have this, I must have that, I must have this, I must have that. And he ended up with, you know, kind of, let's say two-thirds of everything instead of one-third. Right after that, the Iron Curtain descended. And all of a sudden, everything that had happened for the past five years was reversed. So no more good feelings about our Soviet allies. It all changed 180 degrees. And all of a sudden, everybody who had helped the war effort was put in the position of defending. Why did you help the war effort? Look at this. They're communists who are trying to take over the world now. The Iron Curtain has come down. That was Churchill's famous phrase. What were you thinking? In 1947, the Cold War is officially declared. The US government and FBI see communists everywhere. The fear is real. Much of America, terrorized by the atomic bomb, slips into a state of paranoia. Institutional propaganda films, designed to put Americans on the alert against the dangers of communism, begin to multiply. The opposing point of view in this conflict rests on a fundamentally different vision of man. As a creature, not of God, but of the state, in this system, the value of individual man diminishes sharply, and the state is all important. The state will run his life for him, his political life, his business life, his social life. Well, propaganda to work has to be everywhere. Propaganda is advertising, and advertising means you have to manipulate and massage the mind. The survival town Atom Test measured a model village in the Nevada desert against the awesome power of nuclear energy. Buildings of various materials went up. A million dollars worth of equipment was installed, including lifelike mannequins and tons of food to measure the contamination caused by radiation. The big dolls were survival town's sole inhabitants. During the Red Scare, there were lots of opportunistic uh, companies that felt, okay, well, on one hand, we should warn against the evils of communism and do this American way thing. And on the other, we can make some money doing it as well because we'll sell bubblegum cards or we'll sell games or we'll sell books. Anti-communist propaganda is everywhere, even in chewing gum vignettes for children, complete with diabolical images of Stalin and Mao. During the 50s, you know, we were brought up to believe that uh, this communism was bad, that because they had the atom bomb, because we had the atom bomb, there was going to be a war inevitably. And when I was a kid, that was it. You know, I figured, why do my homework if there's going to be a war? Combine the ideo ideological issues, you know, communism versus capitalism, which was never cut and dry with the idea of annihilation, the arms race, 
And that was a real thing. It is in this context that sly politicians began to see ways to take advantage of the situation. Senator Joe McCarthy quickly realizes that it is much easier to get the media's attention by accusing Hollywood stars rather than unknowns or even members of the military. In October of 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee begins its hearings on the supposed presence of communist influence and propaganda in Hollywood. The U.S. public is shocked. There were communists in Hollywood. And I want to assure you that I will not be deterred. By 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee had convened and they started calling the Hollywood heads of studios and, and big star actors up to testify. Why did you make this? Why did you make that? What were you thinking? What were you trying to do? Didn't you realize this was pro-Russia? And they were saying, well, yes, that we were told to do that. They were our allies. We were supposed to do that. And one famous exchange was Jack Warner saying, well, FDR invited me down to Washington and I had a meeting with him and he asked me to make more of these, these pictures that were pro-Soviet. But he's dead. He can't back up that story. It seems so bizarre to say Jack Warner, who was hardly a crazy liberal, is sitting up there defending why he had his Warner Brothers movie stars doing what FDR, the President of the United States, told him to do. It's, it's, in a way, it's laughable. So while Jack Warner was not censured to the degree that he went to prison or anything of that sort for making Mission to Moscow, many of the actors were put in an exposed position. Now some of them, like Robert Taylor, who had been in Song of Russia, sat there on the witness stand and said, I always hated those guys. You know, they made me make this movie, which of course they could do back then. The studios controlled you completely. They made me make this movie, but I never wanted to and I never trusted Stalin and the Russians. They said, thank you very much, and off he went. And of course, there were arch conservatives in Hollywood. But for the ones who didn't have a good excuse, or even refused to even pretend to make an excuse, there was trouble. And a lot of the actors ended up blacklisted for years because they had appeared in these movies, or the screenwriters wrote the movies, or the directors directed the movies. They couldn't defend themselves because it, it seems impossible now because you're just saying this was five years ago. How do you forget five years ago we were fighting side by side with the Russians. I mean, come on. Humphrey Bogart and, of course, Lauren Bacall, they were liberals. And famously, they were not going to be intimidated. They took a train to protest all the liberal actors and directors, John Huston, in 1947, the first wave of HUAC hearings. They got into huge trouble. The press was not sympathetic, they were intimidated, and Bogart had to have his press machine put out pieces saying, I'm no communist, because simply by protesting against the process of the House Un-American Activities Committee, he was labeled a communist sympathizer, if not an actual communist. So if you can make Humphrey Bogart back down, then you know it's serious, because he was always the iconoclastic man of Hollywood. Hollywood is divided. There are those who will collaborate and denounce, like Elia Kazan, Robert Rawson, Edward Dimitrik, and Gary Cooper. and even Ronald Reagan, whose implication wasn't revealed until years later when secret FBI files are finally revealed to the public. At that time, the FBI creates file number 1382196 on an actor. Height, 6 feet 1 inch. 
Weight, 175 pounds. Eye color, blue. Name, Ronald Reagan. Hoover knows that Reagan, then a Democrat, maintained links to the Mafia through his friend and lawyer, Sidney Korshak. When Reagan becomes president of the Screen Actors Guild, which is supposed to be defending its members against the committee, Hoover informs him of his knowledge of the Mafia connection. Reagan understands the implied threat and changes sides, becoming an agent for Hoover under the code name T-10. In secret, he provides a list of actors and actresses suspected of being communists, whilst he is all the while still officially the president of their union. In 1952, Reagan falls in love with a young actress named Nancy Davis, who is listed as having attended communist meetings. Reagan suddenly produces another actress with the same name that no one has ever heard of before, and thus clears his beloved new girlfriend. Hoover closes the file on Nancy Davis. The paranoia at that time was really, uh, was quite real. I mean, people were losing their jobs. People were losing their livelihoods. People were killing themselves during the Red Scare. Uh, and if you, if you worked for certain organizations, um, they forced you to go before the committee. You know, th it was not a, we were the land of the free and the home of the brave, but uh, we were cowards when it came to this kind of ide ideological uh, ethnic cleansing, so to speak. You know, it was, let's get all the lefties out of any kind of business where they're going to affect the, the culture and the society. The film industry is terrified of the possible reaction of the public, which might begin boycotting cinemas. The studio bosses organize a meeting at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. They all agree to refuse to hire any communists or sympathizers, and thus effectively to blacklist them. Cecil B. DeMille was one of the most virulent anti-communists. The only one to refuse to sign up is Samuel Goldwyn, who declares, This is a bad thing you are doing. I won't sign it. These people have done nothing to deserve being blacklisted. I am against it. He would remain the only one. The blacklist is created. Nineteen screenwriters and directors are summoned to Washington to stand before the committee in charge of hunting communists. They all decide to claim their right under the Fifth Amendment to refuse to answer the committee's question, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? The first ten stay united in solidarity. But the eleventh, who is none other than Bertolt Brecht, eventually agrees to testify, answering, no, I am not a member of the Communist Party, thus essentially nullifying the defense of the other ten. Congratulated by the committee, Brecht flies to Paris the following day. The committee suspends their questioning and sentences the other ten to one year in prison for refusing to testify. This is how they became known as the famous Hollywood Ten. Well, Dalton Trumbo, who was, you know, a great film writer and a great thinker, he was smeared, he was blacklisted. He got top billing in Red Channels, which was this book that was published on a regular basis that listed everybody who was considered a communist, and it was kind of like the phone directory. If you wanted to hire somebody, you looked in Red Channels or you called the Red Channels people on the phone. Condemned to a year in prison, Dalton Trumbo is fired by MGM. Screenwriter Ring Lardner Jr. is also fired by Fox. Ironically, 23 years later, he would rescue the studio with the screenplay of M.A.S.H., which Robert Altman would direct, and for which Lardner would win an Oscar. Director Edward Dimitrik is fired by RKO, as are many others. Charlie Chaplin is forced to move to Europe and never resides in the U.S. again. 73 witnesses denounce more than 200 people who lose their jobs overnight. By 1954, the blacklist contains 324 names. Many careers were ruined, and um, some of them, like Dalton Trumbo, lasted long enough to come back again and work in mainstream Hollywood. You know, he wrote Spartacus. And he made movies, but he made them under other names. I think he even won an Academy Award under uh, one of his false names. Um, but he was the, one of the lucky ones. You know, if you have talent and people want you, they'll figure out a way to buck the system. 
He won an Oscar during the 50s and he had used a pen name for it, for the brave one, and somebody else had to go up and get it. So it's like that Woody Allen movie, The Front, where um, you hired somebody to be your front because you had been blacklisted and could not show your face. And of course in The Front, Zero Mostel is a blacklisted actor who's eventually uh, commit suicide because his, his life's been ruined to such an extent. Fairy tales can come true It can happen to you If you're young at heart We are investigating the communist conspiracy in the entertainment world. In 1953, there was such a list, and some of this man's friends were on it. Mr. Prince, do you know Alfred Miller? Mr. Prince, did you know Techie Brown? Do you know Florence Barrett? Are you refusing to answer? Howard, if you don't answer, they can send you to jail. Howard, they won't buy my scripts. I'm on a blacklist, you know what that means? You, 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 you want to put my name on your scripts? It's not that simple. I write the scripts, I send them in under your name, they buy the scripts, right? It's perfect. You're not a writer. No, I... I... I couldn't write a grocery list. You never wrote any of those scripts? Nothing. Not one. I'm, I, I'm practically illiterate. Fairy tales can come true. It can happen to you. If you're young at heart. For it's hard you will find to be narrow of mind. If you're young at heart. Right after the war, we started making anti-communist movies. Uh, you know, the Nazis were no longer our enemy, the communists were. So, you know, I Married a Communist Spy and films like that became the favorite fair of Hollywood. And they did it in part to uh, assage the committee. You know, they did these films not because they felt they would make a ton of money. They did these films so that they could be left alone to do their other uh, more benign films. So it, it's always interesting to see the progression of American thought through the movies. Hollywood never does everything all together. There was a wave of anti-communist movies, but again, they were B-movies, and you're really not talking about big commercial successes. By 1953, when Pick Up on South Street is released, anti-red propaganda is well entrenched in the U.S. Each employee of the studios has to swear that he is not a communist, has never belonged to the party, has no communist friends, and will denounce any person that might be a communist. From the bright lights of Broadway, through the subway undergrounds, to the gutters of South Street, they followed this woman. The bee girl who became a sitting duck to track down her man with a caress, a kiss, and a promise. As the whole underworld joins in a scorching counterblast against the spy menace, in Pick Up on South Street. In France, the Communist Party has become quite sizable since the end of World War II, and American anti-communist films are often altered and softened in their French dubbed versions. This is how Sam Fuller's Pick Up on South Street is rebaptized Le Port de la Drogue in French, and the Communist spies transformed into drug traffickers. That film you stole had government information on it. That girl was carrying TNT and it's gonna blow up right in your face. None of them were big hits, big box office hits. People didn't take them especially seriously, no. Uh, and maybe they didn't even like them especially. 
The Red Menace in 1949, My Son John in 1952. There were many of these, and some of them, like I Married a Communist, were so goofy that, again, you watched them almost for the fun of it because it was like a communist gangster movie. Like the communists are gangsters trying to take over the United States, which actually was the plot of one of Mickey Spillane's big best-selling books, too, in that period, One Lonely Night. But other movies were not done in such a, a black and white way, but it was never a huge wave. I mean, the big Hollywood movies were Audrey Hepburn and William Holden and Cary Grant, and I mean, that's what the big uh, commercial successes were. It wasn't something like I Married a Communist. Don't! No! 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 All right, tell Banning I saw what he wanted me to see. Now I'll find my own way out. Howard Hughes, who runs RKO and is known for his paranoid fear of communists, decides to produce a series of anti-communist propaganda films, such as I Married a Communist, The Whip Hand, and Jet Pilot. He uses these films as a test of loyalty for his employees. Any person who refuses to work on the films is quickly fired. But these anti-communist films are box office failures, like I Married a Communist, which Hughes later renames as The Woman on Pier 13, erasing any anti-communist references, or other films such as My Son John in 1952, or Big Jim McLean, with John Wayne playing the role of an investigator for the Un-American Activities Committee in Hawaii. And it was a big job that brought Jim McLean to Hawaii bigger than any he'd ever tackled before. Because the islands we'd fought so hard to protect not too long ago were in danger again. For behind the splendor of Diamond Head, the glamour of Waikiki, the exciting tempo of Pearl Harbor, an insidious new enemy was at work. In waterfront dives, McLean felt the intruder's hand, but he could never see his face. But each road suddenly came to a dead end. I have subpoenas for everyone in this room. You're pretty tough when you're talking to some guy that's only half your size, ain't you? You just got big enough. But you'd start getting the anti-communist rhetoric in so many different media. F film was only one of those media. You'd get it on television, you'd get it in plays, in books, paperback, tawdry novels, comic books. And all of this was in response to not just the political times that we were entering into a Cold War, but get the committee, get the investigators, get the red hunt, witch hunters off our backs. I'm John Wayne. Is there any better or equal hope in the world, Lincoln asked, than the ultimate justice of the people? We Americans believe there is not. The stonework of our national life is made of this belief. We believe in many things, but this belief that man is a responsible being bears out our own unique stamp as a nation. As a people, we are active and often noisy. We are proud. We are sentimental. Beauty is of national concern to us. We are all these things and many more, but above everything else, we are free. We believe in the ultimate justice which we as free men can create. Our heritage of freedom is our most priceless possession. Men before us have died to keep it alive, and men in our times have done the same. But although men have died to preserve it, and may die again. You still had J. Edgar Hoover finding communists everywhere he looks around, under the beds and so forth, but at the same time, you can watch Sid Charisse slowly melt the ice for Fred Astaire and, and see that um, the American way is the best way. You know, Ninochka, the romantic comedy with Garbo from 1939, shows up again in 1957 as Silk Stockings with Fred Astaire and now it's Sid Charisse uh, in a musical version where she's the uh, Russian apparatchik. So does that mean 
that there's no more feeling that there's a Cold War? No, no, not at all, because at that point in 1957, everyone was terrified of Khrushchev. You know, Stalin, of course, was so scary. Then he dies in 1953, and there's a little changing of the guard a few times, but finally Khrushchev emerges, and uh, pretty soon he's the one that every American is terrified of. After breakfast, during which the head of 20th Century Fox Studios and Nikita Khrushchev had an animated discussion, the president of the USSR visited studios where movies were being filmed. He met several artists, including Marilyn Monroe. While the U.S. might tremble at the thought of communists, it doesn't stop Hollywood from inviting Soviet President Nikita Khrushchev to come to the Fox Studios during his official visit to America in 1959. He's welcomed onto the set of Can Can by Shirley MacLaine, Frank Sinatra, Louis Jordan, and Maurice Chevalier, even as the witch hunt continues in Hollywood. Khrushchev definitely kept the element of, of fear alive because even though we know now much of what he did was a bluff, you know, the, the Russian army, the Russian military, the resources, they had almost nothing. But to us, it was, you know, the race, the arms race, the space race. We considered them our equal, and we were always worried about them being our superior. You know, the Cold War, it goes on well into the 1960s. Don't forget, you also have China emerging. So if you aren't scared enough of Stalin, or you're not scared enough of Khrushchev, and banging the shoe and we will bury you and all of this, you know, then you have Mao, um, who of course was a big problem for Khrushchev, but we didn't know that. Only years later did we find out that very cleverly Nikita Khrushchev was making a big show that he never could have backed up with, with his lack of resources, but he certainly fooled us. Cuban Missile Crisis uh, worked out, luckily, but we were waiting every day for the whole thing to start World War III. Castro marks the second anniversary of his revolution with the biggest military parade ever staged in Cuba, featuring tanks and other heavy weapons from Russia and Red Czechoslovakia. Shortly afterwards, Castro demanded the United States Embassy drastically reduce its staff to 11 persons. It was the last straw in his long campaign of provocation and harassment. President Eisenhower broke off diplomatic relations with a message read by Press Secretary Haggerty. There is a limit to what the United States and self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. I was 11 at that time uh, for the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I can tell you, we weren't laughing. I mean, we were scared. I, I was of the generation where in the first grade, we did the duck and cover thing under our desk. You know, just think about this now. What, what was that for, the duck and cover? It was so that if there was a, a nuclear attack and a bomb landed right through the roof of your school, you would be under your desk doing this so that you wouldn't get hurt. So, okay, so what happens to the nuclear bomb <laughs> because you're, you're ducked under your little wooden desk? I mean, that's what I mean. It's ridiculous. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? <laughs> so much of this is funny, um, but we weren't laughing on these things. And there was nothing funny about the Cuban Missile Crisis. There really were people who built bomb shelters and the civil defense programs that the government was maintaining and promoting to the American people, you know, they were telling you, buy a year's worth of canned food so you can live in your bunker until the radiation goes away. I mean, like, what? <laughs> but the bomb shelter people were there, and some of those were, you know, nutty people who were crazy paranoid but some of them weren't, I think. The paranoia is at its height when John Frankenheimer directs The Manchurian Candidate. Ah! 
in which Lawrence Harvey plays a veteran of the Korean War who is brainwashed by communists so that he will assassinate the President of the United States. The communist press of the time denounces the film as poison and the most vicious attack ever made in an attempt to profit from the tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And it was kind of very serious. You know, it wasn't about irony at all until there were films like um, uh, Dr. Strangelove. Uh, that kind of began to break the Cold War uh, stranglehold on America and make it into satire. I shouldn't tell you this, man, Drake, but you're a good officer and you have a right to know. It looks like we're in a shooting war. The hell? All the Russians involved, sir? Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. Dr. Strange Love. Or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. A moving <laughs> picture. Love that bomb. There were films like uh, Failsafe, which were ver very serious, but they kind of twisted and turned around the idea. Yeah, there could be a war, but we could both be. Uh, at risk, and we could both be the cause of such a war. When Lyndon Johnson becomes a presidential candidate in 1964, he assures his victory with this incredible ad. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. So the Cold War started thawing on the screen um, when screenwriters coming out of that blacklisted period were able to start writing again in a progressive way. So in a weird sense, it was really true that there were all these lefties writing message films for Hollywood, but they were doing it in a very creative manner. And once they were able to be creative again, they started writing more message films. In 1964, Sidney Lumet and blacklisted screenwriter Walter Bernstein decide to make Failsafe. At the same time, Stanley Kubrick is preparing Dr. Strangelove from the novel Red Alert, produced by the same studio, Columbia. Kubrick and Columbia decide to attack the writers of Failsafe for plagiarism. The two screenplays are nearly identical. But where Kubrick brilliantly employs humor to highlight the psychopathic nature of the military, Sidney Lumet uses realism, almost to the point of documentary style. Safe box. Open our operational orders. In fact, the film is so realistic that the U.S. Army insists that Columbia add an announcement in the end credits explaining that the film is purely fictional and that the events depicted had never happened. A technical state of war now exists. It also refuses Lumet permission to use any images of the Army, even censoring the outtakes. General Bogan, keep receiving, no matter what you hear, do you understand? Keep receiving. Columbia decides to delay releasing Failsafe until after the opening of their Dr. Strangelove. And there was always, you know, the studios were saying, okay, well, let's do these religious films like the Ten Commandments, but then other studios would have more message films. It's like Warner Brothers did, you know, more message films than Paramount or RKO. Um, Soon, and after that, you know, you started getting independent directors who were doing uh, their own thing. Hello there, this is your man in Moscow, Carlton Kaduli. This year, an estimated 23,000 Americans will visit the Soviet Union as tourists. We're interested in finding how many Russians are planning to visit our shores. May we speak with you, sir? You, if you're so able to, you can do it. Uh, what is your name, if may I ask? Yuri Rozanov. 
Yuri Rosanov. Yes. May I call you Yuri? You could call me by my uh, nickname. What's that? You. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, you. Are you planning in the near future to visit our great country? Indubitably not. You don't plan to visit? Not than your tin type. Are you interested in seeing America? Not for a minute. I have been there. You have visited yes. our fine country. When, sir? I was there uh, Sunday. Sunday. Sunday a week. You mean a week ago Sunday a you were in America? Sunday I was there. Well, tell me, sir, how did you get there? I got there, you guess. Well, you were in a tour, an excursion? No, I wasn't. By plane? No. By boat? Submarine. That's and hard to believe, sir. That's hard to believe. It's an amazing story to behold, but we could demonstrate it to you. Could you? Well, how could you demonstrate this? We have photographs. You have? Moving. Moving photographs? Moving pictures. Where will we see these? You right here. You took these pictures? Indeed I did. In color and Panavision? Naturally, we invented it. You see, that is how we got to America. The Russians have landed. This whole dang island's under attack by Russia. The Russians have captured the airport. Yeah. Listen, you guys, we've just got to get organized. For God's sake, we've got to get organized. As you can imagine, we were not expected. Don't fire until you see the white. Get out of the way! You help us get bought quickly, otherwise there is World War III, and everybody is blaming you. Well, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming was a fabulous film. I think that really began to say, okay, we can, we can laugh about this. When I was a kid, Khrushchev came to New York, and he docked over on 24th or 25th Street, his boat. And I went, I lived on 20th Street, and we went to school on 20th Street. And we were let out one day because we were let out to go protest Khrushchev. And they didn't give us signs or anything, but we were told we could go to the docks and just go, boo, boo, boo. And I was going, boo, boo, boo. And there was a big, heavy New York cop. They used to wear these great coats, and, you know, they were all drunkards a little bit. And he looked down at me and he said, why are you yelling? And I said, because it's Khrushchev. He says, so what's wrong with Khrushchev? He says, well, he's a bad man. And I said, eh, he's just a guy. <laughs> and that was a cop. <laughs> you know, and it kind of made me think, even at eight years old or however old I was, that, yeah, you know, I'm being pushed into doing something that somebody else wants me to do. And that something else was, you know, be a tool of the propaganda. The 1960s see the spy secret agent become the indisputable central figure in films of that genre. But two opposing types of spy agent emerge. The super spy, incarnated by James Bond, is a glamorous seducer fighting against Russian enemies who threaten to destroy the world. The other type of spy is more realistic, perhaps has an antagonistic reaction to the first. The Super Spies, including the 007 franchise, achieved phenomenal commercial success and revolutionized the genre. James Bond, the notorious, amazing Dr. No secret agent is back, and half the world is out to kill him. As he fits his murderous talents against the Iron Curtain, Agent 007 cuts an inimitable path through the palaces and boudoirs of espionage. James, you're hurting me! I'll be worse than that if you don't tell me. I'm doing this under orders I know, and what are they? Even if you kill me, I can say nothing. The James Bond thing was fun, but it was a comic book. And, you know, we all, we like that yin and yang as, as, as consumers of culture. You know, uh, we want that thing that we could look at and say, okay, this is actually, this has gravitas. And so it, it's like r listening to classical music. But we still like rock and roll, and not only that, we like pop. You know, we like novelty songs. And James Bond was really well-crafted novelty. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. And then, of course, you know, to find Austin Powers as a takeoff on it, it's, these things always spawn their own takeoffs. And Dr. Strangelove was a takeoff of Seven Days in May, of, of Failsafe, of On the Beach, all these nuclear movies that brought fear to our hearts. During the second half of the 60s, a wave of authors such as John le Carré, Len Dayton, and Somerset Maugham start a new movement that would choose to expose the reality of the Cold War and the experiences of real spies' everyday lives. 
Adaptations of The Spy Who Came In From The Cold or even Hitchcock's Torn Curtain bring a much less glamorous flavor to the genre. The book the world could not lay down now stands with the great motion pictures of all time. John le Carre's magnificent best-selling novel, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. What the hell do you think spies are? How big does a cause have to be before you kill your friends? The Spy is no longer a romantic. <laughs> the Spy is a really unfortunate... Per well, it's the same with The Third Man. You know, The Third Man kind of made you feel really depressed and claustrophobic and and the spy who came in th from the cold uh, and these are films about people who are depressing you know and and live in these kind of imprisoned lives so things changed in terms of the script writing because the writers were able to uh, show more of their creative side and and to show that their characters were not cardboard they were human beings At the end of the 1960s, spy films were influenced by the changes and challenges taking place in America. Films such as The Conversation or Three Days of the Condor reflected these changes, and from now on the secret services were often perceived as dangerous and underlined the public's discomfort with security service intrusions into private life. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. This is a major. This is Joe Turner. Identification? My name is Turner. I work for you. Now listen. Identify yourself. What is your designation? Uh, Condor. Something has happened. Section 9, Department 17. The section's been hit. What level? What level? Level of damage. Everybody. Dr. Lapp, Janice, Ray, Harold. Everybody is dead. What is it? What is it? Are you damaged? Damaged? No. Are you armed? Identify the armament. It's a 45 automatic. Will you guys bring me in, please? I'm not a field agent. I just read books. We have games. What if? How many men? What would it take? Seven people killed. And you play games. And the other side does too. We always learn that Humphrey Bogart was the anti-hero. So the idea of the anti-hero started growing wings in the 60s, actually, when Humphrey Bogart became an icon for my generation. Uh, and anti-heroism became part of the vocabulary. So you started seeing these characters who were kind of caught off guard and became heroes, but they really weren't heroes. I mean, uh, Three Days of the Condor was one of those movies that I thought was really quite interesting because it wasn't ideological at all. Whoever, we don't even know who spied against who, really. It was just about how you can get involved in this shit, and there's no real reason except you're involved. You're caught up in the vortex of this uh, horrible experience. And so I think more and more the ideological element of spy movies or war movies get pushed away and you get the human element, and the human element leads to this fact that you're in uh, you know, a, a, a cycle and you have no control over it. And uh, the characters who are involved are, are not heroes, they're prisoners who are just trying to survive in some fashion. And sometimes their survival takes on this heroic uh, context or this heroic aura, but they're not, you know, you look at them and they're not really heroes. <laughs> This is a world of hidden mics and two-way mirrors. A world where nothing is private. Do you think we can do this? Later in the week. Do you think we can do this? Harry Cole is an expert. The best there is. Let me tell you something about Harry Cole. The best bar none. I'll drink to that. Best what? The best bugger on the West Coast. What about me? He can bug anybody, anytime, anywhere. Nobody knows how you did it, though, Harry. It was the hell of a scandal, too. Look, did you see him? The man with the hearing aid, like Charles. He's been following us all They're not people to him, just voices. And the conversation, I mean, that is... Uh, 
Gene Hackman is so the anti-hero. I mean, he goes beyond Bogart. You know, here's this guy who lives in this crappy loft and maybe gets laid every so often, but wears this crappy raincoat. And all of a sudden, he's involved in this thing and his conscience takes over. But he would much rather be somewhere else. Yeah, that's a, a terrific movie uh, for showing how you know, there is nothing special, there's nothing to aspire to in the world of spies uh, or any kind of ideology. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan launched the Star Wars Project, a gigantic space program with the goal of pushing the Soviet Union into a financially disastrous arms buildup. In retrospect, this program is now considered to have contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union. Because in just a few years, Reagan helped bring down the evil empire, as he called it, by engaging in a military and economic competition designed to suffocate it financially. It is in this context that John Milius directed Red Dawn, a highly paranoid film envisioning the invasion of the U.S. by Soviet forces, resulting in a gang of teenagers led by Patrick Swayze forming a guerrilla group to resist occupation. What's going on here, my friend? This is the emergency broadcast system. We are under attack by conventional forces of the Russian army. It is believed the lead waves were disguised as commercial charter flights. Communications have broken down with other parts of the country. Large areas of the Midwest may have been overrun. I know who all of you are, they're looking for you. The Cold War, you think of it as the distant past, and I guess as a Cold War it's a distant past, but, you know, we still don't know what's going on really when you think about it. You look at the last 10 years, you know, that we're not friends really with, with the Russian. There's still spies, and then every couple years, there's another book that comes out that says, guess what? You know, he was a spy. And then there's 500 pages of documentation, and you say, okay, I didn't know that, but now I do. And I, I always think to myself, so what else don't we know? Because you know that two years from now, there'll be something else we didn't know that all of a sudden, you know, you know here it is. Thank you.